The drop bar market's obviously been dominated lately by gravel bikes. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we still have an awful lot of traditional road racing and endurance bikes. Kind of lost in the shuffle in the middle, however, have been the all-road bikes that are, they're not meant for road racing, they're not meant for gravel, but really what they're meant for are kind of like rougher paved surfaces and smoother unpaved surfaces. And they're arguably actually the kind of drop bar bikes most of us should be riding. One of the prime examples of that genre is this bike right here, the Mason Resolution 2. Mason's a relatively small UK outfit, and they kind of buck the trend in that they deal primarily, well, actually they deal exclusively in metal frames. This one here is built from a combination of Columbus Spirit and Life tubing. It's all TIG welded together. The tube shaping is pretty modest. You have a little bit of ovalization in the top tube. The down tube has a little bit of a D shape to it. It's got S-bend seat stays and chain stays, and a tapered inch and an eighth to inch and a half head tube up front here. Sorry, that was my bell. Uh, Overall, I mean, the silhouette's really quite classic. You have just a little bit of slope to the top tube. If you're into, into really traditional looking bikes, this one is right up your alley. Up front, you have Mason's own Aperture 2 full carbon fork. You have uh, a totally normal 27.2 round seat post with a very normal external aluminum clamp. Down below, you have an English threaded bottom bracket. As far as the cable riding goes, it's internal through the frame using Mason's modular port system so you can accommodate a variety of different setups, be it cable actuated brakes or hydraulic brakes or cable actuated drivetrain or an electronic drivetrain. And then up front here, Mason doesn't bother with any sort of like, you know, integrated cockpit. Uh, it's just a standard inch and an eighth stem, conventional bar here, cables are routed externally up front. It's all very easy to service. The whole thing is just all so refreshingly normal. There is a pretty generous allotment of mounts on this bike. Uh, you do just get the two standard bottle mounts inside the frame. Sorry, it is still just an all-road bike. They're not really expecting you to do a bunch of back, uh, bike packing or anything on this thing. But you do have uh, full front and rear fender mounts, rear rack mount, uh, no top tube feedback mount, unfortunately. Uh, but all in all, it's pretty much all set up for a good long ride. As I mentioned initially, this is an all-road bike, not a road or gravel bike. And so it has middle of the road tire clearance. As you see it here, uh, you can fit up to 30 millimeter non knobby tires with fenders or you can go up to 35 millimeter again non-treaded tires without fenders so a pretty good allotment of tire clearance the frame is steel so it's not especially light actual frame weight for this 52 centimeter sample that i have here is 2155 grams so you know about roughly double what you'd see in a carbon frame uh, built up with a bunch of campagnolo super record 12 mechanical components uh, with hydraulic disc brakes and then fulcrum racing zero carbon clinchers uh, Challenge 30 millimeter Strata Bianca open tubular tubeless tires, and then a decently high-end finishing kit from Physique and Zip. The whole bike comes in at about eight and a half kilos without pedals or accessories, and that works out to about 18 and two thirds pounds. Uh, and then adding pedals and cages and that sort of thing will bring you up a little bit over nine kilos, but all in all, it's not too bad. Uh, as far as the retail price goes, uh, Mason does sell this in a bunch of complete builds. I brought it in as a bare frame. Price for that is 1,600 pounds or about 2,200 US dollars or 2,900 Australian dollars. Looking at the bike, again, it has a very traditional silhouette. You can tell it's very, it's really a very elegant and pretty looking bike. You don't generally buy bikes to look at them though. You buy them to ride them. So how does it ride? Does it ride like a quintessential steel bike? Yes and no. People love to assign all sorts of generalizations to how a bike rides based only on how it's made. You know, like a carbon fiber bike is, you know, stiff, but kind of dead. And an aluminum bike is super stiff and uncomfortable. Steel bike is, you know, somehow, you know, lively and comfortable and still reactive. And the titanium is just sort of like this wonder metal thing that can seemingly do no wrong. I'm not really one to assign those generalities based only on frame material though. I will say that this bike does ride like how I expected it to ride as far as a, a, a quintessential modern steel bike. But there's a key word in there and that's modern because while the bike does look pretty traditional you have to remember that the tubes are fairly oversized and then steel being a pretty stiff material inherently when you oversize those tubes you do, do get a pretty stiff frame so what do i mean by all that on the plus side the bike is really pleasantly stiff and responsive those bigger tubes really make the bike kind of like get up and go when you put down the power the handling is really precise. You really don't have a huge sense of any flex anywhere in the frame, at least not any flex that you don't want anyway. 
Uh, if you expect that a steel frame might be a little bit softer, then th that's not what this bike is. It is very responsive. I would say it's pretty carbon-like in that respect. Uh, I would say that Mason also nailed the geometry and the fit of this bike too. It is a little bit more relaxed up front in terms of the handling. The trail dimensions are somewhere in the low mid 60s. Uh, and then as far as the fit goes, it's still a pretty long cockpit. The front end's maybe very, very slightly taller, but all in all, I really didn't have any issues getting the fit where I usually want a road bike to be. Uh, you can see here on this bike, I do have the stem slam, but I think most people, you're gonna have plenty of room to kind of go up and down and get everything where you need it to be. In terms of ride quality though, that's where things get a little bit more mixed. Again, people usually expect that steel bikes are going to be super comfortable based on what a lot of people say online and you know, what you hear from you know, other, your, other, your other riding buddies and that sort of thing. But again, the tubes on this bike are reasonably oversized and while that does pay dividends in terms of the bike's responsiveness and stiffness under power, you do lose some of that comfort that you might expect from a steel frame. The seat stays aren't particularly small, for example, because you have this kind of slightly sloping, somewhat more traditional profile. You don't have a ton of seat posts sticking out either, unless you maybe go undersized. So overall, in terms of the ride quality, I'd say the bike is comfortable, but most of that comfort is coming from the tires. So the tire setup is pretty key. The frame itself is pretty stiff riding, I would say, not, not harsh by any means. Uh, it's also very nicely communicative. Like you don't have a whole lot of that, you know, kind of like dead feeling that you get from a lot of other frames, uh, composite frames in particular. I mean, there is something to be said for that. Uh, and up front, I would say that Mason, by virtue of how they've kind of overbuilt this aperture two fork, the front end in particular is not as soft riding as I would have expected. But again, if you make a good tire choice, it's pretty cushy. As for the bit of that, you know, a little bit of an elephant in the room, the frame weight. Again, as I mentioned, it's 2,155 grams. It's not a lightweight by any means, but again, if you're buying a steel frame, you're not really buying it, expecting it to be super light. Uh, it is about twice as heavy as what you'll get out of even a kind of mid-range carbon road frame these days. So it's not like it's nothing, it's a decent chunk. Did I notice it while riding though? Not really, I would say, and especially on rides that I was on where it was kind of more rolling terrain, wasn't a huge amount of climbing. I wasn't really paying attention to the weight so much as I was just how nicely the bike rolled and how nicely it handled, how nicely it felt overall. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, I'd say it was really quite a joy to ride. You know, I did notice that weight, however, when I was on a really big day with a lot of climbing because while this bike was built up pretty light overall, it's pretty hard to ignore the fact that you're carrying an extra kilo around or an extra, you know, 2.2 pounds relative to a bike that say, you know, let's say you have one that's six kilos or something like that. I mean, it, you can get bikes that are super, super light these days, and this is not it. But again, if you're going after a super lightweight setup, you're probably not looking for a steel bike anyway. All in all, though, I would say that the, the weight really wasn't that big of a deal. And the pluses, I'd say, in this case, outweigh the minuses. Again, if you're looking for an ultralight bike, this is probably not a bike that's on your list anyway. As much as I liked how the bike rode overall, again, how it handled, how it fit, that sort of thing, I do have some complaints with it. A lot of them have to do with Mason's internal cable routing system. Uh, the, their multi-port system's kind of neat in that you have little bolt-on caps at all the ports so you can accommodate, you know, DI2 or SRAM ETAP or a mechanical system. You, you have a decent amount of flexibility. Maybe it was just my frame, but Mason actually doesn't include quite as many caps as I would have preferred. Uh, like one of these caps I actually had to drill through to, to feed the brake line through because uh, it was sized for a four millimeter derailleur housing. The other thing that's kind of weird too is if you're running a mechanical setup, you do have to run the rear derailleur housing through the top tube. is isn't that big of a deal, but the fact that it exits up here and then has to be strapped to the seat stay with a bunch of plastic clamps, I mean, it seems a little bit cheesy for what should be a really high-end steel frame. Uh, maybe Mason expects that more people are going to be using DI2 or something like that, or, you know, like I said, SRAM ETAP, a wireless setup. And maybe that is the case. However, my guess is that a lot of the people who are looking for a steel frame are also going to be running a traditional drivetrain with cables and housing. In which case, personally, I would like to see the cable riding cleaned up a little bit. As far as the cable riding goes, as far as the setup, pretty standard for the most part. It's not fully guided. You do have to kind of fish it through. The big gripe that I have is the lines that run through the down tube because you do have to run those lines through some foam tubing to keep everything from rattling. Mason does include that stuff, but you have to run it. And if you don't take the time to run it, then you're gonna end up with a bunch of noise whenever you're riding on a bumpy road. The other thing too is if and when it comes time to replace a brake hose or a derailleur housing, that sort of thing, 
you can't just pull the thing out and then feed in a new one. You're going to have to pull the bottom bracket out because you need to make sure that all those lines once again feed through that foam tubing, which is kind of a pain. So am I nitpicking a little bit? Yeah, maybe, because realistically, I mean, if you're not building the bike up yourself, if, if you're not doing your own maintenance, realistically, even with a mechanical drivetrain with the full cable housing, you're not really doing a whole lot of maintenance on this thing anyway. It's all pretty well sealed up. So if you ignore that stuff, I mean, ultimately, I had this bike a lot longer than I was supposed to. Sorry, Mason. And that's honestly because it's such a nice bike to ride. Again, it's not the lightest. It's not necessarily the absolute cushiest and smoothest bike I've ever ridden, but it just feels really good. It does exude a lot of that classic steel persona that you expect. It has all that nice liveliness, that just slight tinge of buzziness that you kind of want. Like you have that communication through your hands and you always know what the tires are doing. You just kind of have that feeling that the bike is a little bit, you know, has a little bit more of a personality than some other composite bikes or aluminum bikes, that sort of thing. Overall, I mean, it just is a really beautiful bike to ride. It's gorgeous to look at. If I were in the market for a steel all-road bike, honestly, this would be on my short list. I would personally pay for it and wouldn't mind having it in my own fleet. Well, those are my thoughts on the Mason Resolution 2. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the section below. Make sure you check out the full written article on cyclingtips.com and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can get alerts when we have a new video up and so you never miss another video from Cycling Tips. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.